Thank you for the opportunity, Pastor, to share with the folks a few things. Probably 33 years ago, just before we came to Australia, I shared with a it much. He had gone through a lot of struggles in his life. Frankly, his life was pretty much a worldly things had gotten in his way in life and a marriage that was not in good shape. After getting to know him a lot better, I had, he had been an acquaintance but not knowing him. It had become a reality to me and how it had changed me from within when I was 16 years old. A teenager who you thought, you know, just kind of wandering through life, trying to find out who they were and what they were. But one day, a, a man sat on the lawn at a camp. And as four of us other guys... So I shared that testimony with this young man. We had talked about it in the weeks prior. But during that time, he bowed his head and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as his own personal Lord and Savior. And God saved him. He went on to sing in church and, and work in a church for a while. Gone through a lot of struggles in his life. But the one thing I have assurance of is that day he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as his only hope, and his personal Lord and Savior. I switched just a few months before that, and I sat down with a man that was 60 years old. I can see the little place we were sitting down, and I turned to him. I said, you're getting old. <laughs> And I said, you, um, have you ever trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? He had gone to church all of his life. In fact, at his advanced years, he had heard a man by the name of Billy Sunday preach, which is ancient history to all of us. Mm -hmm. But he was a famous baseball player who got saved and was kind of a, he was an evangelist in America and he kind of just ran around. He, he had about four or five words on a piece of paper, and that was his notes for the sermon, and he'd read them as he ran by, and uh, wasn't tied to that. Enough, but he had heard him in his early years. He had been in church for years, mostly in a very liberal church. But I asked him, I said, have you ever, ever trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you ever asked him to be your own Lord and personal Savior? He said, no, I haven't. And I shared with him the gospel, and his response was, I asked him, why haven't you done this? And he accepted the Lord. And I said, well, why haven't you done this before? He said, no one ever asked me to. I went, wow. No one had ever given him an invitation to Jesus Christ. And then I come many years later, and sitting at my dining room table, I began to share with a person the gospel. Now, they had another background than mine, but I would got to know that person, and it was a lady, and we began to talk. And interact and with even a little bit of a communication barrier, we began to share back and forth. And we got to the very simple, because when you're dealing with somebody with another background and language, 
the gospel really becomes quite simple. It's who is Jesus, who are you, and what do you need to do to accept him as your savior? And that day, that person bowed their head and trusted the Lord Jesus as their savior. That person today is in heaven. The first person was my half-brother. Randy and I had not grown up together. But that day, he bowed his head and got saved. I tried to witness to my mother. Was never able to lead her to Christ. The second person was my grandfather at 91. A religious and probably one of the kindest. Men I know bowed his head and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. He too has gone to glory eight years later. And the last person was June, who you all know, June Kim, who's gone on to be with the Lord. The Bible says, lay up treasures in heaven where moth won't corrupt, nor thieves break in and steal. You know, one of the most important things and most important jobs you have in your life is telling other people what Jesus has done for you. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 this evening. Acts chapter 1 and and verse 8. There's a lot of things in the Christian life we can do. A lot of things that we should do. A lot of ways we ought to behave and a lot of things that we ought to respond to. But I want to give you five keys of being used of God tonight. Because I think everybody here has a heart's desire that God would use them. One of the great joys in my life is that in spite of me and in spite of all my weaknesses, the Lord has given me the opportunity to tell other people of Christ. I've heard different statistics. I don't know what's true and what is some good preaching. But I would certainly say that probably less than 10% of people who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior have ever had the privilege and the honor of leading someone else to the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard it's as low as 1%. I don't know what the percentage is. But the question has to be in every one of our hearts tonight is, is God using me like he wants to use me? You know, you may lead one person to Christ your whole life. But I think of, I think he was a a man in a shoe store that worked in a shoe store that led D.L. Moody to the Lord. Now, I don't know how many people that man led to the Lord, but D.L. Moody, they say, possibly won personally a million people to Jesus Christ. The reward of those souls, I don't think, and folks, it's not us, it's the Lord that does the work. It's not Dale Moody's alone. There was another man who was faithful. Another man who was faithful. And then there was another person that was faithful to lead him to the Lord. And another person that was faithful to lead that person to the Lord. Heritage. Children are a heritage unto the Lord, and spiritual children are too. They too have that. A very familiar passage in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's pray. Father. I pray that you'd take tonight and 
Give us a vision of what you can do with us. Lord, that we would learn the keys to being vessels unto your honor. And Lord, we take the power that you promised and use it for the purpose that you gave it. Guide us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. It says there, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. There's a lot of talk today in a lot of churches about the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they're using it for a lot of different things, usually just to build a big building and a lot of numbers and uh, having a rock concert. But the purpose here clearly of the power of the Holy Spirit of God is that ye shall be witnesses. Because the job of witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ is not something that is done by the skill of the flesh, nor by the work of man, but by the Spirit of God in the lives of people. We have a Christianity today that is a very works-based Christianity. It's about what you do, who you are, and uh, how you're performing. But God says, no, it's what I do in the lives of people, in the hearts of man, and you can't do that. But what you can do is you can be the vessel and the tool that I use to bring the message to a lost and dying world. You can be that vessel that I use to tell other people. Now, folks, let me clue you in. We use the term soul winning, but folks, you cannot win a soul to Christ. You can witness, but you can't win a soul to Christ. How many times we pray on Wednesday nights together and we pray for the souls of people. Why? Because we can't do anything about it. We can witness till our, we're blue in the face, till we're weary, and everything else. But God's Holy Spirit must work in the hearts of men. And God's Holy Spirit must convict them. God must give them the clarity of thought and the wisdom and the insight to understand that they're lost sinners. And without Jesus Christ, they're destined for an eternity in hell. But there's a God in heaven who loves them. He loves them so much that he died on a cross for them. And that they have to come to the point in their life when there's a conviction in their heart to realize that I can't do it myself and without him I am hopelessly lost. And the Holy Spirit of God comes down and touches a heart. But we have a job to do. And that is to tell them the story. We can be a witness. Now the first thing essential in being a witness is to have witnessed something. Wouldn't you say? You know, can you imagine sitting in a courtroom and the, the defense uh, attorney says, uh, I'd like to call this witness to the stand. And he calls him up there and he sits upon the stand and he says, sir, there was this accident. And he says, what did you see that day when uh, Mr. Jones was driving down the street? What did you see that day? And the witness says, well... I was in Buffalo, New York that day. I didn't see it. You know, there's a lot of Christians, a lot of people out there trying to witness for Jesus Christ who've never met him. A lot of people who are uh, trying to tell somebody about something they don't know anything about. Now, the first thing that you need to do is know something about what you're witnessing to. And you need to know Jesus Christ because our job is not to witness about heaven. It's not even to witness about hell. First of all, you've never been to either place. I hope. Some of you said, I've been through the one place, but <laughs> I've never been there. Yeah. Okay, I've never lived there. Okay. Uh, but, you know, you haven't been to either of those places, so what are you doing talking about them? You know, I, and around our churches, oftentimes people say, if you died today, you know you'd go to heaven. Well, that is the result of biblical salvation. But the reality is, the witness that we have is a witness of Jesus Christ. 
And that is one that you can know. That is one that you can experience. And that's the one that you can view. And if you don't and you haven't experienced Jesus Christ and you don't know him, first of all, you will be amiss to talk about him because you'll think, ah, oh, well, what if I say something wrong? I, I don't know. That, that's one thing. I can describe to you my family and my children. Why? Because I know them. I know them. I can't describe to you pastor's daughter, who, other than the picture on his tie, I, I don't know her, you know, I've never met her, I've never spoken to her, I can't tell you much about her. Uh, I used to be able to tell you where she lived, but I don't even know, that. I think it's St. Joseph, Missouri or someplace like that, but you know what, I know very little about her, and folks, we need to know about Jesus Christ. You can witness to him without knowing him well. But if you don't know him at all, you can't witness about him at all. Because you only know what you've heard. Now, I've heard of people. In fact, we work, I worked together with a man. He'd gone to Bible college. He'd done a lot of different things. I pastored churches. And then he got saved. Wonderful thing. And he had witnessed. But what he had witnessed and what his witness was, something he had heard from somebody else. Now, you won't be a good witness until it is your experience with Jesus Christ. Until it is you that experience and know him personally. Until your walk with him is a personal walk. Until your fellowship with him is a personal fellowship. Until you spend time with him, fellowship with Jesus Christ, or witnessing for Jesus Christ, will be very, very weak at best. Because all it will be is kind of like the moon is a reflection possibly of the sun. It isn't very bright, is it? And your witness won't be very bright either. God wants to use you tonight, and God wants to use you to be a witness of him. And not of heaven, not of hell, not of all the things, not of all of this church. But he wants you to be a witness of him. Because, folks, it's not this church or heaven or hell that's going to save them. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him alone. So you need to tell what you've witnessed. You need to um, realize that witnessing is personal, not professional. I know we go to many churches, and, and I don't know if we've ever had one here, a, a soul-winning class. And they teach you how to lead somebody to Christ. Well, folks... We have gospel tracts back there. There's about anywhere from six or eight verses to maybe 20 verses on those different gospel tracts. Go learn those. You're, you're equipped. Why? Because witnessing is not being a professional. Witnessing is a heart matter. It's because you care. It's because you care about somebody. The old saying, they... They don't care what you know until they know that you care. You know, a lot of people say, I've gone, I've talked to these people, no one wants to listen to me. Maybe it's because they don't think you care. You know, when you really care about somebody, people figure it out. And then it becomes important. Just as important in your witness is the fact that you care about who you're witnessing to. It's hard to deflate a genuine witness. When someone is telling them, and you can tell that it bothers them. It bothers them that you're not a Christian. It bothers them that you're not, you don't know their Savior. It bothers them. It should concern you, and it does concern them when you don't care. The better you know the Lord, the better you will witness. You talk about what you know, and it will reflect in what you say. Our witness needs to be one. And uh, Vance Havner, a great preacher in America, wrote a lot of books. He had great, a lot of great one-liners. He said, and I think this applies to witnessing for Jesus Christ. He said, preaching is not the performance of an hour. It's the outpouring of a life. Witnessing is not giving you, giving somebody everything you know. 
Witnessing is the overflow of your life. Because you're rejoicing in the Lord, your joy is bubbling over. Because you're burdened for the world, your burden is bubbling over. Now, folks, don't give them the dregs at the bottom of the coffee cup. Give them what ran over the top. Give them, you know, it's just, my cup is full and running over. That's what it should be. Is that Jesus has done so much for me, I want him to do it for you. I can't handle anymore. My cup is full and running over and, and there's enough for you. You know, that's one thing. There's always room at the cross for you. There's always room for one more at Calvary. There's always room for somebody else. You don't have to give them what's left over. You can give them the excess of your life. So first of all, you need to be a witness. The second thing, if you're going to be a good witness for Jesus Christ, is you need to listen to that person. You know what? Life is tough. And everybody's having a tough time. Anybody here not have a problem? I've got a few to share with you if you have. You know, if anybody's free, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> we all have problems. It may be as light as a cold. It may be as heavy as a death. But we all have problems. We all have insecurities and all have heartaches and all, all have stories to tell. But you know what? There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother that cares about those. And you're his representative. So it's your job to listen to those. Why should you care? Because Jesus cares. And you know what? I find that most people will tell you what their heart is, what's going on in their heart and in their life. If they're open to the gospel, they'll start telling you the burden they bear, the sorrow they have, the loneliness they have, the concerns they have, the heartache they've gone through. You know what? Jesus knows that every care. You know what? We're all going to have those all the way through our life. But there's someone that can share that with them, and that's your Savior. So it's time for you to be there for them and listen to them and hear that. And when you find out where they live, you're going to find out just as the Savior did what's needed in their life. Remember some of the passages in John chapter 4, uh, the woman at the well? Jesus came to a well and... Uh, obviously, he understood the culture, and the lady came in the middle of the day, which wasn't the normal time for a lady to come, so he knew there was something wrong. Now, obviously, Jesus knew everything. <laughs> he was God. But he also was teaching us. The obvious is there. There's a broken heart. There's a tear in the eye. There's disheveled clothes. There's a financial issue. I mean, just open your eyes. It's not hard to figure out what people's burden is. They're walking with a heavy heart. They want to talk to you about something. And they'll tell you what that is. This woman at the well came there with a heavy heart and a burden. Why? Because sin is always heavy in your life. Sin is a heavy burden to carry around. People think, oh, well, you can have a lot of fun at, the, at, at sin. No, it's a heavy burden. Some people put on a good look, but sin is a heavy burden. And he said, come unto me, all that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my load is easy and my burden's light. Jesus wants to lift the heavy burden. He wants to carry it for you. He wants to do that. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And he wants you to tell them. So he found a woman at a well who was filled with sin in her life. You know, some sin is obvious. Some sin isn't. I remember one of the godliest ladies I knew. It was John Brown's mother. Those of you who know John. Lovely lady. She came to a young man who had been in sin and paid a heavy price for it. 
but was trying to get his life right and was in church. And she came to him and she said, you know what? The only difference between you and me is everybody knows your sin. They just don't know mine. Folks, we're sinners saved by grace. Tonight, you can know the Lord Jesus' forgiveness if you don't know him. But as a witness, you need to go out and share those burdens. He came to a man, or a man came to him by night, Jesus one time, and he began to talk to him because he was fearful of those that he was with. His name was Nicodemus. And Jesus knew him. Folks, one thing I learned is, there's only about five or ten, by about ten different things that people go through. Pretty basic things that people go through. And once you figure out that people aren't that different, Henry and I have had a chance to spend some time together. You know what? One thing I've learned is Koreans are just as crazy as Australians. And both of them are almost as crazy as Americans. You know, people are people. People are people. They have jokes about mothers-in-laws. And they, you know, they, they, they have all kinds of things. The people are people. And they're not that different. You think, oh man, I, I just don't know the Bible well enough to be a good witness. I just don't know how to do this to be a good witness. Well, first of all, I agree. So that means you're going to have to depend upon the Lord to guide you. If you think you can do it yourself, you already missed the boat. And I'll get to that at the end of the sermon, okay. But, folks, God will give you the wisdom you need and the guidance you need if you'll just look to him. But realize, it's not as complex as the devil wants you to think. And it's not that hard to witness. And the thing is, a witness just tells what they saw and what they know. God doesn't ask you to tell what you don't know. He just asks you to tell what you do know. And that's enough. In fact, most of the time when they want to ask you questions about things you don't know, it's just to sidetrack you. The devil's just trying to get you off the path. You say, I don't know about that. That's beyond my pay grade. But you know, this one thing I know, that once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. I don't know a whole lot, but I do know what my Jesus did for me. You know what? They can deny your view of creation or revolution, but they can't deny what you tell them that Jesus did for you. They can't deny that. And so you share with them what the Lord has done. And then thirdly, uh, of course, uh, we saw not only that, but Jesus had a rich young ruler that came his way. And he knew what his need was. Everybody has a need. You say, rich people don't have needs. The rich young ruler did. Religious people that know all these religious things, I could never argue with them. Oh, they're as lost as anybody else. See, folks, it's not who they are, it's who they know that matters. That's what matters in their life. They're lonely, they're sad, they're, um, um, sometimes they think they're too bad, sometimes they think they're too good. Sometimes they're an atheist. I had a guy uh, that I'm with, and Henry knows because Henry watches him beat his golf club on the golf bag about every time we play. He gets mad and angry, but he's an atheist. And he's thought about it, and there is no God. Ah, oh, Lord, just give me a bit more time. <laughs> Lord, don't take him yet. Give me a bit more time. I want to see little John, we call him, because he's not real big. Little John could get saved. I think that'd be good. Because he's, he's a smart atheist. But he doesn't know my Jesus. He doesn't know my Jesus. Religious? Oh, yeah. Indifferent? Yes. Oh, they have great needs? Yes. But folks, <laughs> I could show them Jesus because he meets the need. He cares He's God. He's the creator. He's their friend. He's everything that everyone needs. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus tonight. Thirdly, tell what you know. That's enough. Folks, if you're going to be a witness for Jesus, 
Just tell what you know. Now, let me encourage you this. Learn a little bit more. You know, that's why you need to be in church so you can learn a bit more. That's why you need to memorize some Bible so you have a bit more. And, and the more you have, the better you'll feel about it. But you know what? Jesus won't put anybody in your life to witness to that you aren't enough. Why? Yes. Remember, it's called the Great Commission for a reason. Because it's a co-mission. Jesus and you. The Holy Spirit and you. God and you going out. Now, let me ask you. How much is enough? Is you, let's see, is Rivo and Jesus enough? Oh, it is. Okay. Uh, let's see. Is Edmund and Jesus enough? Yeah? Is Edmund and Jesus enough? Yes. Yeah, amen. Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay, all right. Is Pastor and Jesus enough? Amen. Let me ask you, is Pastor enough? Okay. No. <laughs> Folks, none of us can do it alone, but none of us are asked to do it alone. You're not asked to go out and witness all by yourself. In fact, if you think you got to do it all yourself, you're not doing the Great Commission. He sent them out two by two. You thought it was two disciples. Nah, it was him and them. That was the two. That was the two. Folks, because you can win somebody to Christ by yourself. As long as Jesus is there and the Holy Spirit's working in the hearts of people. You know, oh, well, you know, we, we say we go out two by two, and I don't think that's a bad idea. But folks, the person you need to be going out with is Jesus and his Holy Spirit. That's what you need to be going out with. That's the one that goes there. Many questions are only an opportunity to cause you to stop and stumble and sidetrack and avoid the gospel. The devil will throw them out very often. But you know what? The map is simple. You have the problem. What's the problem? We're all sinners, and without Jesus Christ, we have no hope in eternity. We have no hope in this life. We're a bunch of no-hopers. The problem, the reaction is, what can I do? What can I do? I'm lost. I need to be found. The solution is what Jesus did on the cross that he died for you, and he died for others. So what will you do about that? So the problem, reaction, solution, it's all there. The Hegelian dialectic, how you like that one? I threw that one in, okay? All right. Um, but grace will save them. Acts chapter eight, fifth, 16, excuse me, Acts chapter 16 and verse 31, if you'd like to turn there. You know, we need to accept Jesus Christ, not accept heaven. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Salvation is of the Lord and salvation is the Lord. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I personally believe that Jesus Christ is what we get is how we get eternal life. Eternal life is not living for a long time. Eternal, Jesus said he was the life. He is eternal life. This life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. He hath not the son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Jesus Christ is the life because my life is hid in Christ and Christ is eternal. How do I get eternal life? I'm in Christ. That gives me eternal life. I'm either in Christ or outside of Christ. If I'm outside of Christ, I have no hope. But in Christ, I have eternal life and in Him. So we need to come to Christ. We need to, that every person, every person needs to trust Jesus Christ because He died on the cross and paid for your sin. Sin must be bad. You say, what's the main job of a witness? To tell them of the Savior, but first of all, I've never found a person who wasn't lost that wanted to get saved. 
See, our job is not to teach them that good men are in trouble with an angry God. We're to teach them that bad men are in trouble with a good and loving God. God is not bad and we're good. It's we're bad and he's good. And until a person becomes a sinner, they can't get forgiveness of sin. There was a story in New York in the late 1800s that a, a man had been convicted of murder. Uh, and he was convicted to, to die for that because they had, still in New York, back then they weren't quite as liberal, they still had the death penalty. And whether you agree with it or not, we won't go there. But the judge read over his case and told the governor, and the governor wrote out a pardon to pardon this man for his, for his crime. They took it to the jail and they gave it to him. They slid it into his cell. And all the man had to do was sign it and receive the pardon. The man said, no, I won't. And they said, well, all you got to do is accept it. And they said, no, I won't. They actually took that case to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court determined this, that a pardon, though given, is not in effect until it's received. And that man died because he refused to take the pardon and ac accept it. It was given to him, but he wouldn't take it. You know what? That's what sinners are. There's a lot of sinners that are so proud that they won't receive the pardon that God has given to them and hands it out. And you may be sitting here tonight, and God's offering you a pardon for your sin. But you say, I'm not that bad a person. I don't need that pardon. I don't want that. I'm not worried about hell. Well, you may not be worried about it, but you will one day be. And God's saying, here, I love you. Here's a pardon. Take the pardon for your sin. Folks, we just need to be handing out pardons. Now, not everybody you hand it out to is going to be, receive it. But Jesus is giving you a big stack of pardons. Me. Maybe we need to do a track up that says, you're pardoned. You know, say, I'm handing out pardons. I'm handing out pardons. Uh, the only way it's good, though, is put your name on the bottom of it. And, yeah, to receive it. To receive it tonight. Have you received the pardon that God has given for you? And then finally, you know, you know what that means. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean I'm done close to being finished. Okay. He says, uh, uh, Many people will not trust Christ, but no, and, and this is kind of for good witnesses, know when the Spirit is working and when it is not. If you're going to be a good witness, what you have to realize, many of his disciples went out and spoke. Jesus himself went out and spoke to people. He said, but if the works had been done in Chorazin and, what's the other town? Chorazin and uh, another town had been done in you, they would have repented long ago. If the work had been done in, you know, in Nineveh. Oh, I tell you, a lot of times people go and witness and people refuse the message. Realize it's not your job to run the Mack truck through the wall. Your job is to hand out the pardon. And as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Be a witness for Jesus. Be a witness that knows and listens, is led by the Holy Spirit. You know, one thing I found is usually leading somebody to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and being a witness that sees the fruit one thing I learned about fruit picking, I don't know, I grew up around, we had apple trees on our farm, as well as a lot of other stuff, but we had apple trees. And my mother liked Northwest Greenlings, which are a great big green apple, kind of like, is Granny Smith's a big green, aren't they? Yeah, big green apple, great big thing, I'm about that big, huge apples. But you could go down there, and the problem with the green apple is you can't tell when they're ripe. But you know how you tell when a green apple's ripe? Because when you go to pick it, all you got to do is go, just pick it up a little bit and turn it. It comes off just like that. 
comes off just like that. You know, winning a person to Christ is not how good a talker you are and how clever you are and all the words you have to say. When someone's ready to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, it's kind of like you can't stop them. One man said, he said, I do everything I can to bring a person to Jesus Christ, and then I do everything I can to stop him from accepting him. He says, because if I can stop him, he's not ready. When a person finally realizes they're a sinner lost and on their way to hell, you can't stop them from getting saved hardly. It's pretty tough. Realize that it's not as hard a job as you think. I remember the day I got saved. Mike Champollion, the guy who led me to the Lord, didn't have to twist my arm. I was ready. I wanted a Savior. I wanted to know Him. And God came into my life and changed my life. Be a good witness. Witness for the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. God wants to use you. He doesn't want you to be that 90% that never get the privilege of seeing a child born into his kingdom. He wants to use you. Go in the highways and hedges, he said, and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. God wants to fill his house and he wants to use you. Let's pray. Father, pray, Lord, that you'd use your people to be witnesses to his glory, to your glory and your praise and your honor. Lord, that the Lord Jesus Christ might receive the honor and praise he's worthy of. Guide us now and use each one of us, Lord. Help us to be ready to go out and tell what we know and what we've seen to others that they might find the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name.